Welcome one, welcome all. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Star Citizen Alpha Bootcamp. Today, we're taking a look at the backstory of Star Citizen. Remember, this is a companion to the Tales of Citizens podcast. If you'd like to hear us discuss the ramifications of the design outlined in this episode, head over to talesofcitizens.com or check the description. Hello everyone, I am Bridger, and our goal with the next three episodes is to provide you with a solid understanding of the history of the Star Citizen universe. We spent our very last tetrahedron of tachyons to record a lecture from the year 2944 and bring it back to you here today. Let's listen in as Professor John Smith gives us a broad overview of the history of the United Empire of Earth. Hello everyone! Is, is this is on? You can hear me? Okay. Welcome one, welcome all, welcome to HIS 103, the history of the third millennium. I am Professor John Smith the 10th. Thank you for joining us. And that goes out to those of you here in New Oxford tonight and those of you joining us across the spectrum. I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Roberts Space Industries and New United for making the full History of Humanity series available to everyone on the spectrum. Today I'm going to give a broad overview of 1,000 years of history, from 2000 all the way to today, 2944. And I ask that you please hold your questions until the next class. We have a lot to cover and not a lot of time. so. Throughout the semester, we're going to go into much greater detail with most of these figures and events. But for now, I want to ensure that you all have a proper understanding of the overall timeline. Many of you already know the big details, but I guarantee that everyone will learn something today. Now, if you'll recall from HIS 102, the history of the second millennium, the 20th century was a time of great change for humanity. At the start of the century, we were still utilizing beasts of burden. By the end of the century, we had not only landed on Earth's moon, but sent several probes into the far reaches of the solar system. The current slide here shows one of the most famous photos from that period, known as the pale blue dot. This is a picture of the Earth taken in 1990 from a distance of roughly 6 billion kilometers. Now there's a famous quote by astronomer Carl Sagan from the 20th century concerning this photo, which I will save for the end of the lecture. This brings us to the 21st century. This is where our journey begins for the semester. Outlooks were bleak about humanity's future. The Earth was overcrowded, resources were depleting, and violence was erupting all around the Earth. This was before the creation of the United Nations of Earth, when the various powers were still all claiming individual sovereignty. It is at this height of uncertainty and doubt that a major breakthrough is announced by Roberts Space Industries. A scientist by the name of Dr. Childress, along with his team, created the first self-sustaining quantum drive engine in 2075. It had a maximum speed of 1% of the speed of light, or about 3,000 kilometers per second. <laughs> Scoff all you want, that was a big deal back then. Now, it was a, a big deal because it allowed us to travel to Mars in hours instead of months. In the early 22nd century, progressives on Earth wanted to strike out and colonize Mars. Soon enough, scientists were working on a way to create an atmosphere on Mars capable of sustaining life. The conservatives on Earth argued that humanity shouldn't be playing God and denounced the attempt. Despite this, the project was fully funded by 2120. This would be the first terraforming project humanity had ever attempted. And now I see some of you already know of the tragedy to come. Now in 2125, a mere five years after the Mars terraforming project had begun, everything looked positive. They had an oxygen-sustaining environment in place for two whole weeks. Everyone was confident that the project was very nearly complete. Even the most pessimistic had ceased wearing their environment suits. Unfortunately, history is a cruel teacher, and she punishes hubris most of all. 
There was a miscalculation in one of the atmospheric processors that caused a catastrophic destabilization in the oxygen environment. All 4,876 men and women working on the Mars project died in that tragedy. Now, despite this setback, the project was continued. Over 40 years later, in 2157, Mars was officially opened to colonization. And 50 years after that, another breakthrough in drive technology improved the maximum speed by an order of magnitude. Humanity was now able to travel at 10% of the speed of light, or about 30,000 kilometers per second. This led directly to the creation of the Artemis Project. Now, many of you already know the story of the Artemis. The first colony ship, designed to travel at sublight speeds for centuries, carrying 5,000 humans in stasis chambers. The ship was controlled by an AI named Janus. His job was to fly the ship to GJ667CC, which was believed at the time to be a possible habitable super-Earth. What happened after it left the solar system in 2232 is a mystery to this very day. Contact was lost with the ship, and it was never heard from again. There was a recent discovery which suggests that the ship somehow wound up in the Stanton system and stopped to make repairs, but no one has been able to find anything further as of yet. That was the first and last sub-light speed colony ship sent out into the stars by humanity. As you all know, shortly after the disappearance of the Artemis was the discovery of the Nesso Triangle, an area of space that seemed to swallow up ships without a trace. The first such documented disappearance was the Goodman, a cargo vessel that was knocked off course and disappeared while in direct radio contact with the Neptune comm station. The following is the last recorded moments of the Goodman. Copy that. Adjusting course two seven eight. Y'all got it sorted out? I think so. Gave us a bit of a scare, but I think we're okay. How's it looking? We're back on track. You guys good? Back to send a tow. No, we got engines back up. And now it's online. Huh? What the hell is that? Hey Pete, do you see this? Signal lost. The man to finally explain this phenomenon has gone down in history with the other great explorers, Columbus, Magellan, Armstrong, and Keating. His name was Nick Croshaw. After almost 10 years of study, Croshaw approached the Nesso Triangle in a ship of his own design and successfully navigated the first interstellar jump. The system he arrived at after he left Seoul still bears his name today. The Croshaw system, of course. Obviously, we now have many dozens of systems colonized by humans, but Croshaw was the first step humanity took outside of Seoul. A hundred years after Nick Croshaw made that fateful jump, the Croshaw system had been terraformed, and three new jump points had been discovered. The possibility of expanding appeared to be limitless, except by resources. No single human nation, not even the superpowers, had the resources for constant expansion. It would take an Earth-wide effort to continue human expansion across the galaxy. That was the sentiment in 2380 when the heads of government from all over Earth gathered together for a summit. The result of that summit? No less than the unification of the entire human race under a single sovereign entity known as the United Nations of Earth, or UNE, which is the governmental predecessor to the United Empire of Earth that we have today. It didn't mark the end of violence on Earth, but when it came to the greater universe, humanity was now under a single united banner. And not a century too soon. Just 58 years later, we encountered the first intelligent alien life. Today, you know them as the Banu. The official story was that of explorer Vernon Tarr meeting a Banu vessel and at first misidentifying it as another explorer. 
so he ignored it and kept working. Once he realized it was an alien ship, he contacted the authorities, who showed up with a delegation representing the UNE and made first contact. That is, of course, a lovely story, but one which was eventually rumored and later confirmed to have been a cover-up. In 2438, Vernon Tarr did indeed meet with a Banu ship. He did indeed misidentify it at first. He thought it was a rival explorer looking for the same jump point as him. So naturally, he opened fire. Once he realized it was an alien race and he'd just bungled first contact, he finally called it in. The government officials froze the comm systems and convinced Vernon to play the hero instead of the bungling idiot that he was. The good news is that it all had a happy ending. The Banu recognized the misunderstanding, and two weeks later, an official alien delegation arrived in the Davian system and established contact with the UNE representatives. Over the next few months, a concrete translation system was created, and in October of 2438, the Interstellar Peace and Trade Accord was signed with the Banu. Now, now, this is as good a place as any to discuss the Banu in order to give some context to their interactions with us over the last few centuries. Uh, the Banu Protectorate is a collection of planet states with a, a, a weak centralized governing quorum which tries to resolve differences between the planets with relatively little success. They don't have a standing military but are approximately equal with humanity from a technological standpoint. And they can pull together a formidable fighting force if the planets all band their militias together. Perhaps the most important aspects to humanity when it comes to the Banu are trade and crime. The Banu value trade very highly, which is why their treaty with us contains so many provisions for trading from the very beginning. There have been times in the last 500 years when the UEE has tried to temper the flow of goods to and from Banu systems, but they have had little success. The primary reason for this lack of success is that the Banu are simply too disorganized. The Banu on one planet care little for what happens on another Banu planet, unless, of course, it is threatened by other races. For this same reason, crime is common in the Banu Protectorate. Banu criminals can outrun the law simply by moving to another Banu planet. There is a woeful lack of extradition treaties between the Banu and between the Banu and humans. In addition, treaties prevent the UEE or the advocacy from pursuing criminals over the borders into Banu territory. As a result, Banu planets are a haven for human criminals as well. Looks like we ran out of tachyons. Check out the Tales of Citizens podcast, episode number six, where we discuss storytelling in science fiction games, or click the link on the screen to watch the next episode. I'm Bridger, signing off. Have a good one, everybody.